Welcome back. This is the second video in our discussion on the binomial coefficients for uh, math and computer science for 47 students. You'll remember in the first video we started off with a couple problems and in the first video we actually solved this one of the walker, how many ways there were to walk. We saw a connection between Pascal's triangle and the binomial coefficients. If you haven't yet, I would encourage you to pause the video now and take a look at problem number two. See if you can find an answer for that. Do that now. All right, in this second video, we're going to continue on in our discussion. We're going to talk about three famous theorems, I call them celebrity theorems, that involve the binomial coefficients, and we'll see them uh, applied in various situations. And then in the uh, third video, the one after this one, we will talk about proving some identities of these binomial coefficients. All right, now on to these theorems. We call them the binomial theorem, the multinomial theorem, and Newton's binomial theorem. Each one has to deal with expanding a power, a binomial or a trinomial or, or multinomial, uh, raised to an exponent. Now, the binomial theorem is one that you may have seen before. It's uh, uh, best shown through an example. So you'll remember from your first algebra class is that any time you raise something that's not zero to the zeroth power, you get one. And raising something to the first power means you just have the same thing back. And if I square something, remember I have to multiply these and use the distributive rule and uh, remember to multiply the inner terms, but I end up with something looking like this. Now as you continue on, what we want to pay attention to at this point are the coefficients that we get. You'll get 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, and 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. And hopefully this is sounding very incredibly familiar to you. And maybe you've seen this before. But these numbers that form the coefficients in our expanded versions of these uh, binomial powers, these are the numbers from Pascal's triangle, which we just saw in the last video, are the numbers, are, are binomial coefficients. Okay, so this is where the name binomial coefficient comes from. When we talk about these choose numbers, they are actually the coefficients in our power of a binomial. This is why we call them binomial coefficients. Now as you take a look at them, uh, you'll see that we have a definite pattern. We're reading off rows of Pascal's triangle as we form the coefficients for one of these expanded powers. So the binomial theorem just kind of puts this into, into symbols. If you're taking x plus y and you're raising it to the nth power, where n is any non-negative integer, then you're going to have an expansion of powers of x and y. The powers on the x will start with uh, the highest power of n, then the powers on the x will drop by 1 each time. At the same time, the powers on y will increase by 1 each time, until finally at the end of your expansion there are no x's left and we have a y to the n. Now the coefficients are going to be the numbers from the nth row of Pascal's triangle. We're going to have n choose 0, which is always equal to 1, and uh, that's where we always get 1 for our coefficient on that highest power of x. Now the next coefficient is always n. It's the, uh, the same as the exponent, and that is the same as n choose 1. The numbers that follow those are the n choose 2, and so on. And for any n, as you figure out what these numbers are and expand them out, you'll see that you get the same thing you would if you had actually multiplied these all out. Now, why is that true? Well, we'll, uh, we'll sketch an idea that will be very useful to us later in the course. So let's, let's take a look at this. When I raise a binomial to an exponent, if I were to do it the long way, I would actually just multiply these all out. And I'd have to use the distributive rule many, many times. I would take x and multiply it onto both of these pieces, creating xx plus xy. I would take y and multiply it onto both of these pieces, creating yx and yy. Now I've kept the order uh, the same as it was heading into this. So when I times x onto the left, uh, from the left onto the, uh, the two terms on the right, I'll start with an x, and when I multiply y onto the terms on the right, I'll start that uh, piece with a y. Now, as I continue along, and I look at x plus y cubed, and do that distributive rule many, many, many times, um, you'll see that we get a bunch of terms. If you were to actually combine these, you will see that you have an x squared y, this is also equal to x squared y, 
and uh, this one over here is also equal to x squared y. And so we could simplify these and get the 3x squared y, the x cubed, the y cubed, everything that you uh, are familiar with seeing. What we're doing, though, is taking a look at where these coefficients come from. Now, if I were to take x plus y to the fourth, for instance, and I wanted to look at the coefficient on x squared y squared, I've gone ahead and highlighted each term that is equal to x squared y squared, and I'll see that my coefficient is 6 just because there are 6 pieces that involve 2x's and 2y's. Now if I look at that, because each of these does involve 2x's and 2y's, the number of them is going to be exactly the number of ways to scramble 2x's and 2y's, how many ways there are to permute those, uh, those symbols. Well, you can imagine that that is going to be just uh, the number of ways you can take uh, four spots, choose two of them to be x's, and leave the remaining two to be y's. So four choose two is also equal to six. And so that kind of tells us why we would expect this theorem to be true. In order to have n minus two x's and two y's, what we're going to do is imagine all the different ways we could order n minus two x's and two y's. And uh, you can think of having n blanks, and if you choose the two y's, you'll have uh, n choose two as the number of ways there are to do that. All right, so please uh, feel free to take a look at these examples in more depth. But this idea of counting all the different orderings will give you a definite connection to the, the combination numbers, the choose numbers, or the binomial coefficients that we've run into before. All right. Now moving on, you can do the same kind of thing if you raise a multinomial to a power. So a binomial just involves x and y. A multinomial can involve more than two variables, and we can certainly raise these to powers. So in the original problem, we were asked to find the coefficient of x squared y cubed z in x plus y plus z to the sixth power. Now multiplying these six pieces together will be a horrendous task. It will take a very long time for us to do it by hand. What we really want is just to know how many of these terms, if we did distribute, did distribute them out, would involve two x's, three y's, and one z. Well, we can count that by just imagining that we have two x's, three y's, and one z, and we need to count how many scramblings there are of those six letters. Well, we have a formula for that. The number of such scramblings is six facts factorial over 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 1 factorial. And so this number will be the coefficient on x squared y cubed z if we were to actually expand it all out. What's nice about this formula and also the binomial theorem in the, uh, on the previous uh, uh, slide is that you can figure out individual coefficients without having to use the distributive property. You can jump right to the answer. Now this number is 654321 over 2 factorial, 3 factorial, 1 factorial. If you uh, like, you know, you can simplify this. 6 factorial is 720. 3 factorial is 6. 720 divided by 6 is 120. And if we divide that by the 2 factorial and the 1 factorial, we'll end up with just 60. So 60 is the answer for the coefficient we were interested in. Now, in analogy with uh, what we've written for notation for bi binomial coefficients, we can come up with a notation for these multinomial coefficients. We'll write 6 and then the numbers 2, 3, and 1, all separated by spaces, to indicate that 2, 3, and 1 are the numbers that would appear in the factorial version of the formula. All right, now what does that mean? Well, if you want to completely expand out x plus y plus z to the sixth, what you would need to do is look at all possible ways of um, breaking the exponents totaling up to 6 up as exponents on x, y, and z. You can figure out the coefficient on each of those terms. Uh, each one of them will be one of these multinomial coefficients, we call them. And then if you to add together all possible terms with the correct uh, coefficients, you would have the complete expansion of a multinomial. That's what this theorem says. What we're going to do is take x1 through xt, add them together, and raise them to the nth power. The answer will be a summation of many terms. Each term will involve some 
power on x1, some power on x2, all the way up through some power on xt, but these exponents should all add up to the original n. The coefficient will be exactly what we've been saying, the multinomial coefficient, which is equal to n factorial divided by n1 factorial, n2 factorial, and so on, up through nt factorial, which we abbreviate with this uh, parentheses notation now. All right, so the multinomial theorem is a generalization of the binomial theorem that allows for more variables. Let's go back to the binomial theorem, but this time let's generalize not however many things are inside, but let's generalize what the exponent can be. So Sir Isaac Newton has his name attached to this theorem, and uh, it, this one is a very important theorem. What we'll do is allow alpha to be any real number. So alpha could be a negative number. We can deal with negative powers. We can also let alpha be a, a fraction or, or even an irrational number. What we'll need to do if we do this is uh, figure out how to take alpha choose k when alpha is not necessarily a positive integer. Now, beyond that, beyond that weird factor, you'll notice that a few other differences here. Our summation here is going to go towards infinity we're never going to be done adding together the terms of this uh, expansion. And the exponents appear just a little bit different than they did on the earlier slide. This time we're going to have k on the x instead of on the y. But uh, you'll see that as before with the ordinary binomial theorem, the exponents do add up to the exponent that you originally started with. Now, how do we compute alpha choose k when alpha is not even necessarily an integer? Well, we have this formula. You'll remember that when we want to find, for instance, 5 choose 2, what we would normally do is say 5 factorial divided by 2 factorial times 3 factorial. Now, the 3 factorial would cancel with many of the terms of the 5 factorial, and you'd end up with just 5 times 4 over 2 factorial. The same thing will be uh, applied here. If I want to find alpha choose k, it's not going to be as simple as taking alpha factorial because that may not even make sense. But what I'll do is I'll take k factorial on the bottom and I'll start subtracting one at a time from alpha, keep multiplying the numbers together so that there end up being k numbers multiplied together on the top. Right, that may be a bit abstract, so let's see a, a specific example. Here's our example, uh, a similar example to what we saw before. 8 choose 3 ends up being 8 factorial over 2 factorial, or sorry, over 3 factorial, 5 factorial, but the 5 factorial cancels with most of the 8 factorial. We end up with just 8, 7, 6 on the top, 3, 2, 1 on the bottom, and that ends up being 56. Now if I were to take 1 half choose 3, it may look a little bit different, but it's the same idea. On the bottom we're going to have 3 factorial, so that's still 3, 2, 1. On the top, we're still going to have three numbers. And then just as the 8 started with 8 and then went down by 1 each time, we're going to take this number, 1 half, start with that, and then subtract 1 each time we, we move on to the next number. So 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. Negative 1 half minus 1 is negative 3 halves. Now when I multiply these all together, I'll end up with a total of 1 16th. And so I would say that 1 half choose 3 is equal to 1 16th. Now with that understanding of what these coefficients are, it's amazing that the same formula that you saw in the binomial theorem works even for non-integer uh, non exponents. So as a quick example, we're going to take a look at approximating a, a root of a number. One uh, fine print detail to keep in mind, this theorem requires that x and y have this relationship the absolute value of x needs to be less than the absolute value of y. That will be important to us in a second. One other thing you'll notice is that y is raised to potentially a very nasty uh, exponent here. Alpha may not be an integer. Subtracting an integer from it is not going to turn it into an integer. This is a, a bad exponent to raise things to. All right, keep those in mind. Let's take a look at the example. We can use Newton's binomial theorem to approximate the cube root of 1001 using uh, as, as many terms as we like. We can get as exact as we like uh, by using that formula. Now to start off with, you'll note that 1001 is pretty close to 1000. And the cube root of 1000 
is simple to find. That's just 10. So our approximation will probably be pretty close, and we'll probably want to take advantage of that fact that 1001 is so close to 1000. Well, here's how that will help. I'm going to imagine 1001 as 1 plus 1000. I'm going to do this so I can start to see a binomial structure inside the parentheses. I'm going to take that cube root and uh, remember that taking the cube root of something is the same thing as raising that something to the one-third power. So now this looks like x plus y raised to the alpha from the, uh, the formulas, um, uh, from the formula. We're going to do things a little bit uh, more conveniently though. Now that I have the difference plus the convenient number, the thing that actually has a nice cube root, I'm going to factor this number outside of everything. So a thousand is inside the cube root. I'm going to factor a thousand to the one third out of it. And you'll see that even though I've kind of taken an extra copy of the one third along with the thousand, if I were to multiply these back together, I would get back to where I was. These, these two things are equal to each other. Now, because I have factored the 1000 out though, that makes the second part one. So I have an X and a Y that will fit my uh, Newton's binomial theorem. X is less than Y in size, and Y is one. This will be important when we raise Y to the exponent in the formula. On the other hand, in front of this, we have a thousand raised to the one third power which is exactly what we wanted to see. This is the cube root of 1,000, which is a nice number. Okay, so let's actually apply the theorem, the binomial, Newton's binomial theorem. We're going to simplify 1,000 to the 1 3rd power. That's just 10. And then this binomial power we're going to feed into the formula. x is equal to 1 over 1,000. So we're going to have uh, 1 3rd, which is our exponent, choose k, 1 over 1,000 raised to the kth power, and then we would, according to the formula, have y raised to the alpha minus k. Now that becomes 1 raised to the 1 3rd minus k. Luckily for us, 1 raised to anything is just 1. And so doing this, factoring this out to get a 1 here, makes our sum much simpler to deal with. We don't even have to worry about the other part uh, because 1 raised to anything will always just be 1. Okay, now assuming you're still with us uh, conceptually, what we need to do then is figure out what this is. We've uh, shown that it equals this summation here, and we're told that we're, ask, uh, we're supposed to use four terms of the expansion. Well, that's just four terms of this summation, so let's write them out. When k equals 0, we're going to have 1 third choose 0. Uh, as with integers, anything choose 0 is just equal to 1. So we'll have a 10 times a 1, and then 1,000th raised to the 0th power is just 1. When k equals 1, we'll have a 1 third choose 1. And again, anything choose 1 is just itself. So we'll have 10 times a third, and then we'll have 1 1,000th 1, to the first power. Plugging in uh, k equals 2 and k equals 3, you'll start to see that the 1 third choose 2 and 1 third choose 3 end up being more elaborate fractions. But we're going to just put those in with the uh, 10 that was in front and with the appropriate power of 1 over 1,000. Now, if you simplify this out, you'll find that we actually have a very good approximation for the cube root of, a, of 1,001. And uh, we can get as close as we want to the true cube root by using more and more terms of this expansion. So the uh, Newton's um, binomial theorem is a very powerful generalization of the binomial theorem. And uh, these uh, theorems are each a very important theorem. Um, they go by celebrity names. If you mention the binomial theorem, everyone will know exactly what you're talking about. If you say Newton's binomial theorem, they'll have an idea that you're allowing it to the most general case uh, where you might have a non-integer exponent. And if you say the multinomial theorem, uh, people may have to remember what a multinomial is, but they will uh, know that you're talking about raising a multinomial to a power. All right. Now, in the next video, we're going to take a look at uh, some of these identities, um, and we're going to see not these specific theorems, but other identities involving binomial coefficients, and we'll see how to prove those in neat ways. See you there.